Welcome once again to the Letterman Podcast. My name is Mike Chisholm. I will be the ringmaster of this cavalcade of fun and interest. Uh, of course, the fun and interest will be to a select few, but those of us uh, were scrappy and uh, our numbers are collecting as this community in the, uh, the love of David Letterman and company. This community is growing and it's so much fun to watch this thing evolve. I am so honored and blessed and grateful to be a part of the community never mind uh one who hosts the show um the show is not about me though even though i love dave and i've got this enthusiasm for him the show is my job is as i see it is to be a conduit uh for insight a conduit for uh silliness a conduit for some stories about david letterman and company i have an amazing guest that we are going to bring on here momentarily. Mark Malkov, um, I, I said to him early on, we didn't do much of a pre-interview. I said to him early on, I'm gonna have a very tough time balancing uh, the questions that I ask today, because of course, this is a Letterman podcast. Uh, and, and he worked for Dave and company uh, for a year and has had many brushes with the show in all sorts of ways. He has been in the audience for some uh, milestone occasions, including what might be my very favorite episode of The Late Show um, ever, which was the tribute episode to Johnny Carson. Uh, but that segues into the other part of the scale that I'm having a tough time negotiating. I want to ask him, this guy has hosted the Carson podcasts for nearly 400 episodes uh, over the last few years. And, and I am very curious as to uh, how that ride has gone and asking him for advice as the Carson podcast kind of starts to move into its next phase, which I think is ending, but we'll talk to him about that. Um, I need to, I want to ask him questions about that, but I want to keep it about Dave as well. Mark Malkov, thank you very much for taking time out of your insane schedule to uh, come and be with us, our audience at the Letterman podcast. This is great. I mean, for the last eight years, I consistently asked people to be guests on my podcast. So first of all, we're talking about something that I know about that I like to talk about. And that, that's good because a lot of the interviews can be kind of generic. And I'm like, I have no idea what I'm saying. But um, yeah, when I got when you asked me to do this, I was like, absolutely, 100%. So uh, I admire what you're doing. Thanks very much, Mark. Now, before before we uh, get into the Letterman stuff, I'm going to I'm going to plug you as hard as I possibly can when it comes to the fact that you and I are very, very similar. Uh, you may not know that yet, but that's because I don't have a TED I talk. Don't, but, um, I don't I don't have a TED talk that that kind of shows who I am um, for anybody out there. As soon as this podcast is over, of course, don't stop listening now. I mean, God, that would be crazy. Uh, but when the podcast is over, jump onto the YouTubes, find Mark's TED talk and um you know, he is a guy who I can I can very much relate to this. When he sets his sights on something, uh, he goes for it. He goes for it in 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 a kind, polite yet tenacious way, and is not afraid to think outside the box. Um, Mark is an incredible personality. I would almost call you, Mark. I, I, I mentioned this. We were on another show a few weeks back on the late night playset. Uh, you know, shout out to Jay Ryan and Nicole Ryan at the late night playset. Um, I, I almost call you a positive, optimistic Andy Kaufman in, in, in the way that you are almost a performance artist in some of the things that you have done in your life. And you talk about that in your TED Talk. Have you always been the guy that thinks a little bit askew and wants to live in an Ikea for a week or wants to live on an airplane for an extended period of time and do these crazy uh, eccentric kind of stunts? Or is that something that, uh, that, that, that evolved? I was like that as a kid. I was constantly curious, could this happen? Could I pull this off? And I always wanted to do my own thing, which the video projects allow me. I just, I remember just grade school. Um, it was the first day of kindergarten, actually, after um, the teacher telling my mom, Mark doesn't belong in public school, because I wanted to do my own thing. And I just was curious and I just, I couldn't just, I was just bored pretty much. Yeah. Um, but I, uh, yeah, it was just very, um, I guess, strong-willed. And uh, for what, it was one of those things, yeah, I guess starting from there and going, it has been one of those things where if there's something I want, I will push it politely as far as I can. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes it's worked out 
amazingly. It has a lot. I've been fortunate and I've fallen on my face so many times, but I have a really tough time just doing things. Um, I don't want to say normally, but like some people that I talk to when they, when they set out to do something, they're, they're, their goal or their um, what they want is so minute. And even if they just raised it a little bit, it would make the product so much better. But I think I'm just wired that way to do that. Whereas other, some other people just, um, I don't know, they don't like asking for stuff or just the, no, no, I, I don't like, no, I've been rejected on the Carson podcast by hundreds of people uh, of guests. It's not fun, but it's part of the process. And I think um, I'm just kind of, I'm, I know that I've experienced it. So I, yeah, I'm able to do it. I, uh, I, I, I've got goosebumps all over me right now. I'm a student of personal uh, development anyway. I host a, a men's mental wellness podcast um, as well. And, 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 and so this, what you're saying speaks to me. I think it speaks to a lot of us in this audience in particular. I think, um, I think about Dave and company. I think about the company that they built, you know, at NBC, but then also when Worldwide Pants became its own thing. Um, you had a lot of very powerful misfits who came together and, and productive misfits who, who, who just had these personalities that might have been the way you described people who may not have always fit into the general populace, but have this eccentric creative uh, drive or outlet or skills or talents um, and, and want to do something a little bit different. March to the beat of a different drum. Was it like that when you worked there? I guess. I mean, it's one of those things. I don't try to be different. I, if anything, when I was growing up, I tried to fit in and be normal. So I wouldn't get picked on, but I just, I couldn't figure that out. <laughs> and I always did my own thing. Um, yeah, it, let them in for sure. I think like to some people when they got there, it's like, oh, this is, this is a job and this is kind of cool. I'm, I'm here. But the thing is, is that, I mean, I, I was, I, I wanted to work on the show or be in that building, um, from day one on CBS, I mean, even before that, I was going to the late night tapings in 6B and yep. I'm like, I want to get hired on this show. This would be <laughs> amazing. I was really into Saturday Night Live, either of those, but, um, and I'd go to both when I was in high school, but, but, but Letterman, I just was like, how do these people like during the breaks get jobs and get to do this? And I was just obsessed with the show. I was going to the tapings. I, um, when I got to, when I got here uh, to New York, I just remember the early years of the show um, going and just wait, waiting just outside sometimes if I wanted to meet a comedian by the stage door, or um, I just remember talking to interns that worked at Letterman or anybody that worked there for advice on how to get hired or anything. It was like this giant mystery, like what was behind this, the, 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 uh, the door entrance for the stage door. Um, what were the, uh, what did everything look like backstage? Because he pretty much kept the cameras away from showing everything, how the magic tricks were done. So I, I don't know, I can't tell you how many times that I, I it was just in my mind working there. And I, it was one of those things where, and when sometimes when people ask me for advice for TV and stuff, I've been fortunate, there is no way that I would have been able to make that happen. I tried. And of course, the way it happened was a complete accident. And it wasn't me knocking on doors, which is pretty much everything I do. Um, is it okay if I tell you how I got hired? Absolutely, please do. Okay. Uh, and by the way, the, what you're talking about here, the way you're setting up what you're about to say, um, the community that has already embraced our show and, and whatnot, uh, we can all relate to what you're talking about. That fascination, that curiosity, that um, almost, a, it's almost like a magnet pulling. Um, and, and, and so what you're setting up here is beautiful. So, so please do. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was at show number one on August 30th, 93 for Dave on the second row. When my, my friend Dan Brown got tickets because like I sent postcards out and then I'll get to how I got hired. Sent sure. the postcards out, like everybody I knew that I was friendly with, um, I would just increase my chances because you could all, most of the shows where they, they said that they, they were strict. I have no idea one person per address or name. So sure. postcard. So but Dan got back from um, a trip to Michigan and he called me. And I just started, and I'm not making this up, like literally screaming and like running down the streets with my yep. arms in the air, jump, 
been. I mean, I know it's hard for some of the people that w weren't watching this show back then, but that, Dave, that build up to Dave taking it was incredible. Oh, it's huge. I mean, it was the whole summer, the whole summer, frenzy. everywhere you looked. Yep. I, it was a media frenzy. So I, I, I have all this history of going to the show and, um, and all this stuff. And then what happened is I was an intern on um, a couple of TV shows and I was on an intern on um, actually a show that Dave did. Um, he did a voice, which is Spin City, which is Michael J. Fox's show. Yep. So as an intern there, I was about to graduate. I was just very petrified on like, how do you get hired in television? I mean, it, it was, I know people were very nice to me and encouraging, but it still seems like very hard to break in and get hired on anything. Yep. And um, somebody I knew it spin told me they had a friend that worked on Al Franken's show Late Line, mm -hmm. um, which was a, like, a, I think it was just less than a year at Kaufman Astoria. And, um, I went over there to the offices and I got to see the set and, and I'd never seen a sitcom set laid out. I was like, this is, I like, I just like my excitement again, um, through the roof. And then, um, basically I met her and then she passed me on to someone else over there, um, to do if, if I wanted to do audience, um, over there, um, the audience department helped see me, basically a page. And he, he said, right now there's no room, but if, if somebody calls in sick or whatever, I'll call you which never happened, but he did say, but I think I have, but it, it seems like right now that there's another show, and he didn't say what show, that I oh might be God. able to get you an interview with. <laughs> and it was one of those things where I, I never in a million years would have guessed that that, that, that would just kind of like come to me. I mean, but then it's like- Here you go, your biggest wish served up on a silver platter for you. I still have to get by all these levels, so I'm like, I put on my suit. Um, I go to the. How old were you at the time, Mark? 22, 20 <laughs> some, 22. Just a kid. I went over there and um, you get off the elevators on the eighth floor, which used to be where the writers were. And it's like the worldwide pants um, sign and then some plants. And they um, buzz me in and I went into David Kay's office, which was the, the audience coordinator. This is when David Kay, yeah. David Kay was there for years this is when he was first taking over the audience department this is a name that's going to be mentioned on the podcast a lot david k uh definitely um was a personality within within the pants family it was what david had to do and i was there for was extremely challenging what they the letterman uh people especially dave what is their expectations for him it had never been done on a tv show before like it was very complicated we can talk about it if you want but anyway you're talking you know just to just to, uh sure. to give a tease you're talking about the um uh the audience for lack of a better term indoctrination in in selecting making sure it's a good audience making sure it's an audience that suits yeah. the sensibility of the show that's what you're talking about right i, I am and it is one of those things and then i'll get back to my interview with david k that's it's just so hard for anybody behind that desk to do this show when it's not a good audience. Like some hosts are better than others at getting through it. But I've mentioned on the Carson podcast, they just, I mean, especially for Dave, his um, his uh, relationship with the audience and the level, the decibel of laughter and, and making and breaking the show and him just feeling confident out there. It... it it was definitely, I don't want to say it was unhealthy, but it was definitely. <laughs> it was a fixation gonna, to say the least. There's going to be some bad audiences, but I mean, it was one of those things where every show, I mean, I've worked on them. They all would have bad audiences once in a while, but I think sure. Dave just had the hardest time um, with it. And yeah. they brought us in just anybody that, anybody that sent a postcard um, that if they sent in would get tickets. I mean, um they get the tickets and then we they would get in regardless but it was kind of trying to figure out how many of the actual fans there were yeah. I, we can't say fans i was told my first day that they're called late show viewers um we can't oh, no, and i get that i i get that that's uh, creating a culture like in the professional is, wrestling yeah. business vince mcmahon doesn't call it professional wrestling he calls it sports entertainment, sports entertainment he doesn't call yeah. it the champion he doesn't call it the uh the title yeah. belt he calls it the there WWE were, championship there were you know? a bunch of those things so i yeah so um we yeah we just led by david Kitt, and it was very it was extremely extremely hard what they were asking for and 
as they should, their expectations were like sky high. And yep. um, they, and Dave's the first one to admit he expects a lot from everyone, but he expects more from himself. But it's, it's, it, it was tough. Um, I was there and then, yeah, we, the thing was just try to get the audiences better, try to get people that were there um, that watched the show more like a certain amount of those people than maybe some other people who weren't is um, just, I don't know, didn't really watch that much. So and get them in and try to get audiences that were better for Dave. And that, again, a tall order. That's a lot of specific things you're talking about here. We had Eddie Brill on um, one of our earlier episodes. And I mean, he, here's your, your, your warm-up guy for over a decade and, and talking about, you know, the signals that he would give to people about the audience. As he's warming the audience, he'd fill things out and, and, and see how things are going. And I, I, the, the balancing act you're talking about, you've got people from all over the world. And, and nobody in the audience, if it's a bad audience, wants to you know it's not like they're they're trying to make it that they're a bad audience eddie brought up the subject you know what if half the audience didn't speak great english uh you know they're right there would be an example and and because of these postcards like you say so so there's all sorts of factors that could lead into a good audience versus a bad audience but the laughter decibel level that dave was looking for it's almost to the point where um a better audience or a more enthusiastic audience is just as or even more important as the written material, which also had a very high standard I, on I the show to, too, right? I talked to Rob Burnett about this and, and convinced 100%. He said he wasn't sure that Dave would have gone for like the good audience over writing any single day. I mean, if it's a good audience, he can he can get by with the weak writing and make it, make it funny. And I'm not saying the writing was weak by any means, but um, no, it was... It was that, and when he would come out for the pre-show Q&A, sometimes once, uh, once in a while, the first person they called in, and sometimes there's only one, would ask a dumb question. And I think sometimes there were times where, when that did happen that Dave, I mean, what is it, Colbert, when I used to work with him, the, the Second City, he would tell me, they called the audience the beast, and it's like this one cohesive thing. And if one <laughs> or two beast. people, yeah, because they were hard. I mean, it was... I mean, the audience, you just never know. I mean, it is so hard doing the comedy when the audience laughing. And bad audiences don't know that they're being bad 99% um, of the time. And um, it was just hard if you perceived the audience um, through the Q&A to be lackluster. Or yep. if Eddie Brill would tell him when they he would come out, if Eddie would whisper in his ears, good audience, bad audience, or just okay, which happens... Um, on most shows with a warm up like that. Sure. And if it wasn't, it, again, just Dave was told what he had to work with, and it just it was it was extremely hard when the when it wasn't a um, a really good audience with the laughs. Yeah. You know, I love that we're getting into the weeds on this issue sure. because it shows the it shows the level of quality uh, that was expected from the top. And, and I mean, people are thinking automatically, they think, oh yeah, well, the writing, you know, or all the production or the technical aspects or whatnot. But there's a lot of little things that the average enthusiast wouldn't necessarily think. I don't, I don't consider myself a David Letterman fan. I consider myself a David Letterman enthusiast for the same reason. Um, uh, you know, we've got our own little, little uh, eccentricities and the show certainly had that. The standard for the audience, um, and it's funny because I mean, I didn't go nearly as many times as you did. Uh, but every time I went, that indoctrination process, um, it was extremely specific. And and it's funny from from when I went in 05 to even when I went in 2015, uh, very 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 similar. Um, and 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 the standard. So so even when I uh, in in 2015 the, that that night right there, the night where that's that's me and Dave talking in the yeah. audience, and the moment Amazing. got captured. Um, even on that night, uh, getting into the front row. Um, when I talked to the audience coordinator beforehand, I was very specific. Oh, by the way, my party and I understand the deal. We're going to dress sharp. We're going to be enthusiastic and positive, and we're going to be ready to laugh. Not ready to cheer. We're going to be ready to laugh. Yeah. Um, these are things that I had known about coming up as an enthusiast. Yeah. But those things there, when you got somebody cold from middle America 
who has no idea, they're just excited to go see the David Letterman show. Um, you got to teach that to them in a very short period of time. Was that your role? Were you one of the guys who was gra- gathering groups of 20 of them at a time and giving that speech to? What was your role when you were I would there? talk to the audience, but it really wasn't when I was there. They weren't, they did later, if somebody was like, really enthusiastic and they thought it'd be a good audience, put like a sticker on them, which signified that they'd be sat up, sat up front. I mean, if anything, I was just trying to get people going down and just trying to get them in a good mood and get them pumped. But I mean, subsequently later years, way after I was gone, I mean, I mean, it was always an issue. They had to get Alec Baldwin. I mean, Dave asked Alec Baldwin if he did that. that. I've never seen it, by the way, like a pre-tape on how to be a good audience member. I mean, there's just these people and I've seen them that are so excited to be there that they just forget to laugh. I mean, Carson had these people and it's just, it's, it was tough and too much clapping was not good either. I mean, every yeah. single host wants laughter. That's what they want. Clapping can be good sometimes. It can cover up the joke bombs, like like sure. some shows, everybody claps no matter what. Um, but yeah, it was it was definitely um, with, the, with the audience an issue until um, I'm told, and I've been told this by a lot of people, when Alan Coulter took over, I heard yep. that, the, and it's probably, I mean, there's a, a big reason is because the audience knows who he is, and they, they just recognized him right away, he was on the show all the time, yep. and when he apparently, and everybody's told, I've heard a lot of people when he took over, the audience has just got, they got better, I mean, it's, mm. it's, it's like Ed McMahon would come out and talk to the Carson audience. I mean, it's like you put in the face right there and that's when Dave just couldn't believe how good the audiences were and he was coming out for extended Q&A, um, yeah. which is like, I couldn't believe, like when my friends over there were telling me that Dave would stay out there longer than the two minutes or whatever and extend the show. I mean, that was more near the end, but- yes. um, yeah, my encounter with him was like five minutes long. Like it was a really that, cool no. experience for me. I I, I made yeah. him laugh during that. That's like, like, like the greatest moments of my life I, is I made David Letterman laugh. And it, and, yeah. and it was, it was five minutes with just me. Never mind That's the amazing. other guy before me. That, back in the day, you know, Dave is a creature of habit like Carson and um, Dave modeled his career basically in Carson. So Carson, I mean, and Dave, Dave, most of his time, his entire at NBC, 5.30, the music hits in. I mean, no matter what. Yeah, they tape, um, no matter, it's like a drum. It's yeah, it going. Was, yep. it, was, it was like that when I was there, pretty much 5.30, it went. But the guest wasn't there, it, would, it went. And yeah, it, it was definitely with, with the audience being there in the real time. It, there's real, there's some, some of my favorite moments are that they didn't stop tape, whereas now they would yes. probably stop tape on the shows. Yep. But um, but Dave just got loose, and then I started. I know in post before the show, cutting things out here and there, and, and not having it live to tape as much. Most of it was, and um, I'm just glad that Dave was having fun. Yeah, um, doing this. He wouldn't if he didn't like the audience. He wouldn't stay out there for for um, those whatever minutes. I mean, yeah. so, so when you're, this is a fascinating thing to me. Okay. Uh, many times when somebody their dream is, okay, I want my dream job. And they go in and they go behind the curtain and they see, you know, how the sausage actually gets made. And then sometimes the luster for the product goes away for you. And I think, I I think you, and this is another way that you and I are similar. It's for you. You worked there. You actually fucking worked for the, for, 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 for Letterman and company. Um, it was a year. It was a long time ago, but the luster didn't seem to wear off. In fact, the fascination has only gone deeper. You look at the Carson podcast and the body of work that you have done there, by the way, is incredible. If uh, any of our audience is a David Letterman fan, um, obviously Dave's idol is Johnny Carson. The Carson podcast is worth listening to every episode. They're phenomenal. Mark has done an incredible job on that. He did that after he worked for Letterman. So you went behind the curtain and yet the fascination just got even that much deeper. The appreciation got much deeper. Is that a fair statement? I think so. I mean, the thing with Dave and definitely Johnny, it was like this big mystery, like what yes. went on behind the scenes and just the process that they both had. And I just wanted my questions answered for, for Carson and stuff. And just who was this guy? I think with Dave, it's a little bit more, this is who he is. Um, you know, a shy guy around people he doesn't know, but if he feels comfortable and stuff, he can be, 
I mean, he's the funniest guy in the room and yep. just very loyal. But I don't think there was much as much as a mystery as who Carson was behind the scenes and what went on mm. at his show. And um, I, I guess Dave didn't. I mean, Dave did a. Dave didn't like doing the interviews, but he did a lot of interviews. Well, and yeah. That was a little bit of insight. Um, with people he trusted, like Costas or Snyder or uh, Larry King. I mean, he, Dave did interviews with people that he he trusted for, for the most part. doing any interview. I mean, yeah. uh, um, he might say that's not true, but I mean, you can hear it on the Bob Costas. Somebody put his post on, on, on YouTube where he's going to be a guest on later to promote, promote the anniversary. And he's just like, I, I don't want to do this. <laughs> um, Ted Koppel, um, I worked at the Colbert Report and Ted Koppel was on and he, I don't know, got to talk and, and I told him I really liked um, when he sat down with Letterman. And he said to me, he's like, yes, but Dave wouldn't let us rerun the show. He would only sign that it would only air once. Wow. And um, so, <laughs> I, I don't know. Anyway, so I, I got hired, interviewed with, put on my green suit, got hired. And it's one of those things like, we'll let you know by this date if you're hired. And the date passed. I'm like, there's no way. And then it was like two days later or something. That my roommate at the time is like somebody from Letterman called and they're very like urgent you need to call them so I called him and I was like he's like yeah I want you to start and it was like in two or three days and I'm just like first of all I just couldn't believe it a uh to b I'm like I had a day job at this other place and I'm like sure I'm not giving two weeks just I, it was so hard but I told them my dilemma I think that they understood um that I had I didn't have the time and I mean I was answering the phones I mean that was basically my thing I feel yep. like I was easily um well I was and I wasn't that great at my job so replaceable um <laughs> but so yeah then they're like um yeah you're good to go come in this is your first day and it, it was just the most bizarre thing showing up and then they give me the the, the laminate or whatever it's called with my yep. name on it with late show and around your neck and then um do you still have it oh yeah yeah it's on right. my i posted it on my instagram a photo of it and stuff um it was yeah the first day i just remember going up to the eighth floor and just looking at the office is just wide wide eyes being able to go like in the um kind of like where the rest of the audience is if they had to go to the bathroom normally had to go down the, all the steps and that that yep. area that hallway where dave when he was coming from um the 12th floor he'd take the freight elevator all the way down and then jog through that that was one of my hole. questions one of my questions was did you ever take the freight elevator no i never once took the freight i, I was never asked to there's not even not even remotely close <laughs> um did i come to that but uh, the, 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 with 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 there i would take the regular elevator if i had to if i was going into to the studio there's a door that's i guess it's just right if you go in the Ed Sullivan Theater lo lobby, to, to the right, there's a door that they would unlock for me. Right. And then I would go down there and then I'd be in that kind of that area tunnel where you kept walking, you said the boiler room, keep yep. walking, it's Hal Gurney plaque is on your right. Um, the steps are on then your left, which would take you up to where the audience is. And um, yeah, it was so strange being able to walk around and be backstage. I didn't go backstage a lot, but when I did, Especially like my first couple times, like security, I think it was Stephanie or someone, of the, it may be one of the staffers. So There's probably a couple of people like, Mark, you, you know that you work here. It's okay. You can relax. <laughs> and um, just like being able to see like the, where the airlock was and just everything. Like uh, um, when I knew people, sometimes I'd go up. Well, that happened a couple of times during that year, 11 months, yeah. 15 days, but who's counting? Um, <laughs> I, I'd go up to the dressing rooms. I'd go up to the dressing rooms to say hi if I knew someone on the show. And um, that, just everything in my mind, I'm like, I just wanted the answers. Um, what, how does it, this all work? How does this all come together? And um, it was really, I mean, it was exciting for, for, a, for a long time. The work itself was draining. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I can talk about it, it's boring, but at the end of the day, we were all just completely exhausted it would be a 10 hour day which isn't bad. like lots of people work 10 hour days but it was just it was very yeah, but your mind is on that entire 10 hours you're going right like well, the, the machine's never never stopping at that point though we were on the phones and the yeah. phones sometimes people had tickets were calling us and literally there were times where there was an hour wait 
where they people would have to be on an hour to get to us. We try not to do that. Sometimes it was a 10 minute wait. Yeah. Um, and it was like, it was just constant. And then people not happy that they had to wait all that time. But it was like, if you wanted to get a drink or go to the, I mean, it was like, and then it was just so much enthusiasm that you had to show to these people. Yeah. And it just, um, it was, yeah, it, it was, tra- I, for me personally and everyone else, I think just by the end, we were drained from the t- a 10 hour day of doing that. And then, um, I mean, every, but everything else other than that, I did, I pretty much enjoyed. I just remember like the, being at the last anniversary show they ever did the fifth, the fifth yep. um, anniversary in CBS. I just remember after facing the stage, I was by the, the doors um, all the way to, I guess would have been the, yeah, the left. Um, so you were watching that as a staff member? I had thought that staff members weren't supposed to watch they the are. show. Ever. Oh, okay, all right. <laughs> no, you know what? Okay, I actually have this wrong and I'll tell you what I did. If, I, if the audience department, they would let watch, but no, oh, I mean, okay. tons of That was people, the secret. No, they would like the staff, unless you were Lori Diamond or, or Heather, one of Dave's assistants or um, Eddie Brill or Bill Sheft. No, you couldn't. I mean, there were people that didn't get to go to see the show that worked there for years until the final show and they went down and never had seen the show before. So Arthur Kelly and I talked about that. I mean, Arthur answered the phones on Dave's floor for forever. And, and, and yeah, he, he saw very few shows except for the ones that he was actually. Yeah. (laughs) It was just very different. I mean, Dave just would always, and this includes the audience, it would throw him off. He, he said, apparently if he saw somebody he knew, and it was always like, if you worked on the show, you were never allowed to be in the, come back to be in the audience. If he, he just didn't want to see anyone that would possibly throw him up. I actually watched the fifth from the balcony mainly. And that's, I remember that so well. That was such an incredible show. I love that anniversary. But the it's one clip I was show? Thinking, what? Clip show, right? Yeah, it was like Larry Bud Melman in Mar- yeah. memory. Um, and then he comes, <laughs> I'm not dead! Um, <laughs> right. Yeah, I think it was Seinfeld. I'm pretty, was it Seinfeld that came out for the walk-on? In, oh. in I think it was Seinfeld. But oh, it was like this top me. 10 list where it was like every celebrity, every like A-lister after A-lister. And one was DiCaprio, Leonardo DiCaprio. And that, that gentleman, you probably know his name. He was like the large, um, bald gentleman who they would put on sometimes. He was, yeah, big and he just... No, you're talking he, about... Um, he yep. came on <laughs> as one, but it was just... You had to be there. It was incredible. I was thinking, because um, sometimes I'd be by the double doors. I remember there was um, another taping that I was just thinking about, which is when the Jay Giles band was on. Um, and they, I don't think they, they were making a comeback or hadn't done an appearance, but they played like Centerfold or some song that like everyone in the audience knew. I just remember like dancing around and everyone that, but I was there for that on the side. I mean, I would go in when I wanted to. If there's somebody I wanted to see, right. um, I would do that. And a lot of times after the, um, after the Thursday, the first taping, I could, well, if I wanted to, and I would try to, I'd always go to the balcony for the second show and watch. Um, I mean, sometimes I was a little tired or whatever, but um, most of the time I would try to go up there and, and watch it. Cause I'm like, how many people get to do this? Yeah. You're describing watch a dream come true to a vast majority of our audience right now. That's yeah. a dream come true kind of a s- scenario you were in for 11 months and how many days? I mean, I, I, they asked me, I was going to leave after like, I think it was 11 months and then they asked if I'd stay on a little bit longer. <laughs> get, and I'm like, yeah, sure. I mean, whatever you need. I mean, I gave them two weeks. So I think, I guess I would have ended at 11 months. They asked me to stay on. And the, the only thing that was, um, noteworthy of me staying on is that I was in the staff crew photo that year. Oh, that's awesome. Um, that would have been. Where Dave comes out, this is on the stage where Dave comes yeah, out the center of it and then it's all a We yell. were all waiting for him. It was like. You still have that photo? He, he, what's up? You still have that photo? Yeah, 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 yeah. Good. We waited for him. We're all standing there and uh, he was the last person to be there. I think we waited like five minutes, something like that. And he comes in and like, there's people that are applauding. So this is like our boss and like, People are just, there are people there that just, I mean, they, they, I mean, pretty much collectively, they just love the guy. Yeah. And Dave just is not comfortable with that. So every, people are applauding and Dave it literally is like that, does that with his finger. They take the photo, they take like two photos and Dave is like the first one out. Gone. <laughs> I just remember it being such a hot day and being in the Sullivan Theater was always the best when it was a hot day because yeah. it, was, it was so cool. And I just remember, um, I remember that, but you know, Dave had been doing it for so long and it's just, 
I think it's almost anybody that, that has a show like that for that long, they they start as one thing where like they're hanging out with the cat, the, uh, the NBC, he was hanging out with everyone and just it's slowly the demands of the job and just everything take over and it just gets a little bit, um, the individual gets more and more closed off. Sure. Um, but I mean, it's still a low. I mean, he, he definitely had his inner circle um, and he um, didn't owe anybody anything. We were, I'm so many no. people were there just because it was Dave. I mean, they, they didn't like, a lot of them were just like, they didn't like the work, the hours or anything. I have to say the vacation, paid vacation was definitely why some people in the health insurance were some people that, that were fed up. Um, yeah. Paid. But m- m- most of it was just the prestige of that. And um, it was exciting. There were some good, there were definitely good people. There were a lot of people, in my opinion, at CBS that, and I've talked about this on the Carson podcast. There were, I, there were people that just I never saw smile in in, in, a, in a year, eleven months, and fifteen days. It was a tough environment. Some at, at some places on some floors, and there's no camaraderie in terms of that. Everyone's isolated on a different floors, and the Colbert peeps in the Sullivan Theater now still go through it. They've tried to help rectify it a little bit, sure. um, but everybody now there's people that don't see each other for, for months. Um, that are friends on the show that are on different floors and it was just it, it yeah. just when when they were on 14 um at the at, 30 at, rock at, yeah <clears throat> and all together there is something about th- that spirit like when i was at the colbert report we um it was basically like a townhouse layup and we were all with each other i mean the writers were actually on the, the very top level so maybe not them as much but um but it was still like we all were together i mean it was um, it was just that type of thing. And then when they went to the Sullivan Theater, I mean, it's just, it's what the building is very comfortable for the host. Dave loved how comfortable he was at, at, at that thing. And there was no other shows that were taping. Like he didn't have yep. to worry. He did the show at 57th Street at CBS, which never would have happened. Um, no. He just needed a place that was his own. Yeah. And um, I was very anti um I don't want to say anti, but definitely concerned about Colbert going over there for two reasons. One, people being on different floors, which is still, it's a tough thing that they've, they've, you know, it's always going to be a struggle for the yep. layout. But the yep. second thing is, and, and Colbert and company wisely fixed this, was how many um, seats were, were, um, all the sight lines. It was, it was, yeah. When I was there and I would watch this, I was like, they, they, there's no, this is the worst. Um, if he wants a good audience, this is the worst layout. Yeah. It, it, I mean, it was, no one ever said that, but I would just look at it. I'm like, I, I just, it, I, I would, in my head, I'm like, go, if he went to like a regular studio, like he had, like just to make it bigger, like in LA, when he did that week um, from the, the C- CBS um, Television City, yep. um, I just felt like the audiences would have been so much better. That was Carson's yeah. last uh, television appearance. Was that trip you're yeah, talking on about? Camera, right? Yeah, so yeah. I, I just thought the audit it would have been the audiences would have been so much better. Or if you could find a facility in New York that had that, it's just hard getting studio space. Sure. Um, or, or, date, or if he went to ABC or CBS, he would have to, like, you know, be around other shows and other the offices would be would um, be um, yeah around other shows. But um, yeah, once Colbert took care of that, the obstructed stuff. I was, I was, I was very, very happy that they, they well, did that. It's funny. Um, and folks who are, would, would fancy themselves as enthusiasts of Dave, there's many levels of it. Um, and one of the levels is, is to the point where you're at, and I want to move to this a little bit. Yeah, we'll uh, I'm going to treat this, I'm going to treat this podcast like you're never going to come back, but I'm begging you, please be part of this community. We would sure. love to have you back and tell stories. No, about I'm happy this, to come but- back. I've had people. I mean, I've had so many peeps, especially with Letterman. People have been really nice to come back. I think I Bill Shaft on like three times. Oh, that's fantastic! Yeah, like he's that. he's on our list. We can't wait. I'm hoping yeah, to get him. Bill Shaft is phenomenal. Yeah, he um, yeah, he answered everything I wanted to know. It's like the kind of like a mystery about that place and just everything behind the scenes, especially at NBC. Yeah, it was really great um to hear. 
So, so, um, but the levels of fandom uh, or, or not fandom, yeah. but enthusiasm for Dave, uh, uh, one yeah. gal, she's actually uh, Rupert's girlfriend name's Irene. She's going to be on the podcast. She saw the show 47 times wow. and, and to the point where she knew where the good seats were versus the seats where you're going to just be frustrated the entire show. And there were lots of them. They were like landmines all over the place um, true. Where, where, where you thought, you know, you thought it was going to be a good seat. And then suddenly the camera two or whatever rolls right in front of you. And, and, and you're, you're watching the monitor the entire show if you want to see anything. Um, but I mean, again, I look back at that and that's part of the excitement for those who are like a couple rungs up the ladder. You're just happy to be there. You're almost grateful because getting a ticket, especially in the time you were there, holy crap, the time you the were there, there was like a two or three year waiting list, right? There were, I, I told the story the other day um, that I remember somebody named Diana Coulter called in for tickets and she'd written off the postcard. I'm like, we have an, I don't know if you know this, our announcers, Alan Coulter. And she said, he's my father. And she was calling from Northwestern. And that is how people that worked on the show they had to go through the postcard system wow. um, to even see the show. It was, the, especially that the first year, I mean, it was before I was there, but like the first year and a half or two years of the show, it was like, a it was like the hottest ticket in yep. town um, to see that show. It was, um, and that, but it's one of those things where if you have a bad seat, Dave comes out for the Q and A and it's like so excited. And they don't, you don't know, most people, they don't know it's going to be a bad seat until the music kicks in and right. they come out. And then it's like, Oh, I'm going to be watching the monitor for the next. Whatever. <laughs> um, there's two places I want to go before we finish this. I want to be very sure. uh, cognizant of your time. Dude, um, I do three. I do three. I've done three hour episodes. Oh, of and that's my dream. Like I could do this. All, uh, yeah, I'm. I'm an. All I'm saying for the audience, it's probably better, less is more. But I'm happy to come back. I think like okay, my, my the, one the penultimate. Um, Carson podcast because we're leaving um, the, that show's ending shortly yeah. is right now it's it's a three hour show but I think it, we're going to probably maybe edit it down to maybe 2.30 is that the Commissar episode? it is and yeah. I'm so lucky after six years to get, get him and it's one of those things where the episode is warranted to be that long it was yeah. that good we talk about Dave I mean he has Dave's NBC set he has the Velcro suit as she yep. showed the, the Velcro suit to me so um, and Carson's, he's got Carson's set, his last set. He has the set from um, the last 10 years. Yeah. The desk, the chairs, the, the couch. I mean, it's like it, the curtains. It's it's an incredible. He has the turban, the Karnak turban. So yeah, James is going to be on with Carol Burnett on um, Thursday for the second time. After eight years, she's coming back to the podcast. So we have her on Thursday. That's amazing. Um, the following week, we have Richard Lewis, who took me eight and a half years to get to say. Wow. And um, so that was great. And then, um, yeah, we talked about Dave a bunch on that. And then we have- I bet um, you did. They came up together. Yeah. Comic so, store guys. Yeah. Yeah. So we t and then I had Richard Lewis. And it's one of those things. I don't know. But when you reach out to people, sometimes I'm like, if you have 20 minutes. Because honestly, if they'll only give me 20 minutes, I'll take it. But most of the time, they want to keep talking. Yeah. And if they do, I, I just let it ride. But it was one of those things with Richard Lewis, I think, passed um, for 20 minutes. And um, shout out to Jeff Abram, uh, Abraham for making that Richard Lewis thing happen. I couldn't believe it. He's like the best publicist and such a good like uh, comedy historian. So he, um, yeah, I got Richard Lewis and I was like, if I have 20 minutes, it's 20. And he yeah. just wanted to keep talking. It was like an hour and 20. Oh, and that's was, awesome. And he just wanted to, keep, and it was great. I mean, it was wonderful, but I'm always at the same time, like, do they want to stop? But like, um, but yeah, it, it was good. And then James... And then we may or may not, um, James might be the final episode. I'd be happy if he's the final, but there's um, sure. there's a couple possibilities that people that are still out there. David Letterman would not be one of them. Okay. Um, <laughs> I've tried um, for eight years to get him. Um, yeah. I'm not gonna say anything else other than I've, I've invited him. Um, <laughs> through, yeah, it's through the proper channels yep. um, many times and I, what can you do? I, yeah. I asked and he, that's it. He, he doesn't like people he doesn't know a lot of times. I've been told this. I don't know if this is true, but he yeah. doesn't, he's, do, he's been doing so much more press. I'm, my guess is he's a different person. I mean, I think he definitely is. Cause that was back when he like was doing the show and stuff, but he's going on with new people and stuff. But 
I don't know. It might be so, too hard for him to talk about Carson just because it, it was like his mentor and might get emotional or whatever. You're I, dovetailing into one of my questions here. This is great because <laughs> let's so so I'm just gonna set the stage. My um, in my top five episodes of Late Show of all time. Oh yeah. One or two, uh, the one that goes between one or two is the one in 2005 where uh, the tribute episode to Johnny Carson, yeah. Peter LaSalle is the guest, Doc Severinsen um, as the musical right. guest or directing the musical presentation yeah. that night. You were there in the audience. Um, you not only worked for Letterman, the fascination with Late Night and the things that you love continued to the point where you've hosted 300 and some odd episodes of the Carson podcast. You love that stuff. You're a big Johnny guy. You were at the tribute episode. Um, did you know it was a tribute episode? Did you do everything in your power to get in that audience? Was there luck involved? I, um, how did that happen? What was that night like for you? And talk as much as you want about it. It's okay. one of my favorite late, late shows of all time. I think I found out like a, two days before someone. And I just want to go, a guy who really likes Lane and is fascinating. I mean, there are people on staff like Rick Shackman who know yep. everything. I mean, the TV shows that I've worked on, a, the, a lot of the, the the people that are, I don't want to say the biggest fans, but the people that that enjoy the show on the same level as the biggest fans are people that work there. I've seen it time and time again. Yep. Um, so I I knew that, that it was probably gonna be a no but I'm I always like to ask and I there's somebody at the show that was not David Kay that I asked if I could come to the Letterman um the, the Carson tribute and uh I I guess I probably sounded pretty desperate or really eager or whatever and they didn't want to do it but I just was persistent and yep. then they said that they would let me watch in the balcony and, and pretty much um, sneak me in, yep. which they essentially did. And I was told that I, you can't tell anybody about this. At the time, I didn't, of course, yeah. tell anyone. Yeah, but the statute of limitations has uh, has since expired, so we're good now. They, they couldn't put me in the actual balcony seat because that would have meant that I was seeing the show. So they had a fold it fold up chair at the very back of the balcony, next to like right in front of the soundboard. And that's where I watched the show and I did not care. I just wanted to no. be in the same room. Yeah. I mean, I didn't, yeah, it was Peter LaSalle, it was um, yeah, Doc, and then Ed Shaughnessy was Johnny's drummer, Tommy Newsome yep. uh, was there. And yeah, it was one of those things. Like when Dave, after the opening remarks, all those jokes were written by Carson. It's well, like, I was gonna ask the you, emotion. there's a question. Did you call that? Did you did you recognize no. any of that? No, okay. I should have. I, I probably. The entire Should've. monologue was written by Johnny Carson that night. It was. And then when he said that, I was like, but it makes sense because some of the jokes didn't fit in terms sure. of being topical at the yeah. time or some of the things. And I just didn't, I don't know why I didn't, I didn't notice that. It should have been uh, a little bit more obvious. I yeah, Dave came out before the show and I've said this on the Carson podcast um, and he just asked if everybody, um, that he said, Peter's very nervous. He's never done anything like this. And if you yeah. just make him feel very welcomed and, be a good audience for him and yeah. You just named a gentleman who, uh, and I, I use that term it very intentionally. You just named a gentleman that if I could have a conversation with um, anybody, he'd be in my top five. Peter LaSalle, because sure. uh, I'm a huge Craig Ferguson fan sure. as well. Um, uh, um, and I'm, I'm not afraid to call myself a fan of Craig, uh, an enthusiast of Dave, of course. And then the reverence I have for Johnny Carson. You've got Peter LaSalle, who is a bridge to generational uh, hosts, generational audiences of comedy. And from everything that I've heard, and I've talked to a lot of people who knew Peter, very kind and sweet, as, as kind and sweet as he was impressive when it came to his job and the sensibilities that came with that job. I don't know if you could be in entertainment at that level and be as kind as that man uh, from what I've been told. And you've, you, you, you've talked to him. Peter LaSalle is a guy who just uh, a legend. He was, I, I couldn't believe that I was going to interview him in his office at CBS when he was still at Ferguson. Like, yeah, I just, I put in an email. I think I write a good email. Didn't even know if he was going to get it, but somebody said this was his email. And then within like 15 minutes, um, his, I got a call and it's his assistant, Chris, um, hope for Peter LaSalle. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. I'm not ready for this. And uh, yeah, 
he we chatted a bunch he was so nice and uh yeah he set a date for me to, to um i think it was like two weeks later for me to go to television city to go and i was like i was so nervous he was in my easily in my top yep. wish list of guests yep and uh i knew he didn't do much of that stuff many of the interviews but um i think it helped that i had some people that i already interviewed that he knew sure and we uh it was a really good time. I think, I mean, he enjoyed it because I could tell he enjoyed it because whenever I'd be in LA, he would invite me back to see him and I'd, I'd, I'd stop by his office. And, Mark, uh, what a sentence you just uttered. Like, are you yeah. kidding me? Like, 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 yeah, if you would have told 22 year old Mark that, hell yeah, every time I go back to LA, there's going to be a time where every time I go back to LA, Peter LaSalle is going to invite it, me over. Like really what a sentence nice. you just said. It was very nice. He couldn't have been kinder. <laughs> I, I never have expectations when I meet people. Yeah. Um, I sometimes I hope, you know, you hope. Yep. People, but um, yeah, he was couldn't have been nicer. I um I asked him to do a second episode um of the Carson podcast, and I'm like, I, I I I will never ask you again to do one of these. But he said he would do it, and in both cases, uh, when he did the podcast during the podcast, there there's some things he said, you know, this is just for you alone. Right. So he, he was, I, I trust your judgment for editing. So I would, I would be, there were just a few things, not a lot of things, yep. but I'm like, probably I should take this out. Um, the episodes are still phenomenal. But, oh, absolutely. Um, but yeah, that was, but I felt honored he trusted me enough that he would tell me stuff. I know that feeling um, yeah. it, because I've become friendly with folks who work for Dave who exact same thing. Like there are some folks who work for Dave who I just, oh yeah, I, I say their name and, and no problem at all and all that. And then there are some who I've, I've become friendly with that I don't even, until they throw it out publicly, I'm not throwing it out publicly and, and some of those things. And what a thing to be able to have the trust of some of these people that you looked up to, that alone um, is, is, is an amazing thing. You said something again, I, the personal development thing that I, that, that, that I love so much. I think this is a secret to life. When you look up to somebody, don't have any expectations of what it will be like when you meet them, just accept them for who they are and enjoy the present as it unwraps itself, not trying to predict what's in the box, I think is a real key to relationships with some of these people. Uh, you'd agree with that, obviously. I think so. And I, I mean, there's definitely some people that I've sat down with uh, over the eight years that, because before pandemic, I, I would try to get out to LA and do them in person. Because it yes. wasn't, Zoom thing recording wasn't a thing, but then it, um, it would have made my life a lot easier. But I would go to certain people that had the reputation for being, uh, even if it wasn't difficult, a little prickly. Sure. For people. And uh, a little persnickety. They were all. Um, they were always so pleasant to me. And part of it is, like, is like, probably just because I, you know, I was. I don't work for them. I was coming in. They were on their best behavior since I'm interviewing them. Yeah. But uh, and I, I, I think also, and I, I know you, you have this too, is that when I would sit down with them, I wasn't asking the same cookie cutter, boring questions that they're yep. always asked. Yep. I mean, I, I, I admire people that can just do this stuff without research and be interesting with the guest oh, and stuff. Yeah. And I've winged it a couple of times when I've had to, but I just can't do, I mean, I want to know as much as I possibly can. Yes. Um, the research, I want to know what I'm going to ask. And then, and then if, if they want to go in a different direction, throw it out, that's fine. And I'll go wherever they want to go. And sometimes that's the best stuff. Sure. But I, I think when they see how much prep I've done, I think that also is a big thing where they relax with me. And then sometimes, this has happened many times, where we stopped recording and then they said, can I tell you something? And then everything that they couldn't say on the tape, yeah, they start telling me. Nothing bad about Johnny, but just other oh. stuff that yeah. they wanted to talk about. Inside and baseball. I, I yep. couldn't believe how people would open up to me. Yes. Um, there's certain guests that I reached out to who the public didn't know were sick and they had all these things. And like, I just couldn't believe that their relatives or handlers trusted me enough with this information. I didn't tell anybody that, that these people were not, were sick or like on their last legs, sadly. Uh, yeah. But people, I, my only guess is I have zero agenda. 
I had when I started this, I had no agenda other than to get my questions answered about Carson what went on, and maybe five people will listen. I never yeah. met anybody who liked Carson remotely as much as me. Like not even close. It'd be people that just, you know, they they casual fans and, yes. and so I didn't know there's anyone else. Um, like me, I had zero agenda, and I think hopefully that showed I wasn't trying to do gotcha questions to be on the front page of film of of news sites and stuff. I so I, I think maybe that's one of the reasons that we're uh, we're very similar in that and 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 i don't want gotcha i just want to i want to know and i want to be a part of it just by asking these questions and getting these insights answered and hopefully entertaining people or giving people insights along the way by the way on the episodes that you winged it uh i would submit that what's in your head already um has prepared you for a conversation with these people that is very different than if anybody ever else even ask them even if you didn't do a ton of prep beforehand because of just the shit that you know the layers of what you know in there you know um you said this on on another show you said you know uh, talking about your wife oh i'm sorry you know i know more about johnny carson than i do isn't that terrible i mean it's funny in a way but it's just it's what it is i didn't try to set out to know probably more than anybody does um I mean, at least when I'm talking Carson's Tonight Show, and I mean, I've talked to so many people that knew him, and there's hundreds. So um, just having that stuff in my head, it didn't occur to me that would happen. And it's, 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 it's definite. It's what it is. I'm grateful that I've had this ride. I feel it's it's a good time. I've got my questions pretty much answered, almost all of them. Yeah. um, To end, and I mean, there's still people I really would want on the podcast, and you know, I've. I've asked numerous times and that's fine. You know, yeah. it's, in the beginning, I would, I would kind of take it a little personal. And then I was like, no, no, don't take it personal. they don't no. want to do it. They don't want it. To, the last yeah. thing I want is somebody there that doesn't want to be there or exactly. Whatever. Yeah. Makes them so comfortable, uncomfortable. And the word podcast, as you might find is definitely for uh, people that are really famous. Sometimes their, their, their handlers is like the kiss of death. Oh yeah. You say the word podcast. Yeah. I know that my that some of the people I asked were never approached that love Carson that were that were never approached. I and mean, they would I love to sit down and have a back and forth yeah. reminiscence and, and all that stuff, but it doesn't yeah. get to that. That's fr- that's that's a frustrating part of show business to me is the layers uh, when it comes to that, because there are folks like you're talking about here. I, I, I bring up the Letterman. There are some actors who are on the show that were specifically told when they guested, they were not allowed to talk about the affinity uh, that they had for Dave and how it was a dream come true moment to just sit down. They were like very pointedly told not to talk about yeah, he that didn't stuff. like any of that. I think Carson appreciated some of that more, but yeah, he was, yeah, ultra specific. Um, I have a question about Johnny Carson for you. Did he ever wear any of his own clothes? Did I ever wear any of his clothes? Did he ever wear oh. any of his clothes? Like like doing a monologue, he's wearing a Carson. Oh, oh yeah. There. I mean, he would, it was basically an infomercial. Um, for his clothing line that was extremely successful. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he was, he would wear those. I mean, and it was huge. And then I guess later and earlier, there's just a wardrobe person that would just get the suits and he would just, um, I know in, in New York, at least he had an assistant for um, a bunch of years that would pick out his ties, but he would yeah. wear and, and what do you think? And, but yeah, he definitely, um, fashion wise it's so interesting to look at the 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 scope of the 30 years what the the fashion was for him and and the guests i mean it's the it's the best possible history lesson is going through those archives and seeing what people were talking about what was this the um what was socially acceptable um who were yeah just at all the trends at the time the dress um yeah i think in terms of going back and seeing what the history was really like I think that shows a very as a strong indicator. Well, let's do a let's do a quick plug for your uh, the show that you were you were part of on CNN, uh, oh. the late night uh, recap show. Is the, the story of late night the history, the history of late night um, that appeared on CNN. The first three episodes of that. Don't get me wrong, the entire run was good. I think there were five or six total, but the first three, uh, the historical record, talking about the Tonight Show. Um, where it came from. And then when Johnny took over specifically and when when certain uh, national events happened, how the show 
uh, like you say, I'm just I'm just putting an exclamation point on what you said so beautifully, um, how it reflected what was going on um, during uh, uh, event, current events of the day and how it molded itself and, and some of the guest hosts that they would have and, and, and some of the groundbreaking things that that show did. You know, there's many people that look when it when it comes to things like diversity and they think, oh, there was none back then. But the seeds were planted in many ways with The Tonight Show uh, in groundbreaking ways. And I don't I don't know that there had been a record of that um, that had gone out as publicly as the CNN show. You guys did a phenomenal job on that show. You're very nice. First of all, they, they, I was the first person they interviewed out of the 99 people for the, the docu series. And it's one of those things I have no clue if I'm going to get in. They were nice to put me in three out of the six episodes. Um, I had n really nothing to do with that other than I was interviewed, but we did a, a, a companion piece that I was hired as one of the producers. The Absolutely. Bill Carter, listen to the podcast as well. Yes. Watch the show, but listen to the podcast with Mark and, and, and Bill that Carter. That was interesting. We had some really fun people yep. that we talked to. Everyone from, I guess, Jimmy Kimmel to Amber Ruffin to people like Jimmy Brogan, Byron Allen. So yep. we had a good time. That actually just won a Webby Award. Which Congratulations. Fantastic. That's fantastic. Oh. Well deserved. Uh, so, so that was uh, that was definitely an interesting thing to do. I, I mean, the docu series. I know people in the, that work for Carson that just weren't happy with it because it's just impo it, it's impossible to get everything. It glossed it, it glossed over. It was like you could do a lot deeper than it did for sure. Thought, a lot of them thought there was just too much emphasis on, on Johnny finding talent and Jim McCauley getting the credit where there was a lot of other people before him that were finding people sure. that were that went on to have huge careers. And um, I mean, Carson was so much more than just introducing talent. And it's mostly a lot that's what it was, which I totally get. Because you're trying to educate and entertain people yes. that might not know who Carson is. And if you're going to do that, you throw out Seinfeld, Letterman, Leno, and it's versus maybe some of the other things. But uh, yeah, it would have been nice if they took a deeper dive. But again, in six episodes, which were like, what, 50 minutes? Yep. Something like that. With commercials, it's an hour. Um, I thought that they did a good job. I, I did. I mean, I, yeah, I was glad to be a part of it and uh, pleasantly uh, surprised that I was in three episodes. I, um, I don't envy people very much. And usually when the envy shows up, it shows up just for a flash and then it turns into, I'm really happy for those people and, and, and excited for them. I have a lot of that with you. Uh, really? The fact that you've talked, Oh God, the fact that you've talked to Bill Carter as many times as you have, the fact that, you know, we talk about Peter LaSalle, some of these Rob Burnett, some of these other people that you've, you, you've spoken with and, and um, but it's, but it, the, the good news about that is it inspires me to go, well, if him, why not me? And and that's True. that's how it works, right? That's hopefully we do that for each other as other humans. Um, I, yeah. I, I I appreciate the fact that you've already said that you'd come back on. This is good because I'm going to hold you to it as much as I can. Sure. I, I know our audience will certainly appreciate it because they don't come on here to watch me. Let me tell you, they mm -hmm. come on here to watch folks like you and my job is to be a conduit uh, mm -hmm. to that. And so I'm grateful for that. Um, two more questions. Number one, I'm a collector of things. I like co to collect things and I've collected some things from the late show um, and, and late night and, and, and whatnot. Um, I've asked you already, did you keep your lanyard? Did you keep, you know, do you still have the photo? What are some cool things, mementos that you have kept, um, from, uh, from your Letterman either days or had gotten since then? I gave a bunch to Don Giller, who I'm sure you've mentioned, or you will mention the Don. Always shout outs to Don Giller. Thank you very much, sir, him. for keeping the, uh, the catalog alive and keeping things relevant during the, uh, the days that Dave was dark for a few years there. So yeah, absolutely. Oh, I, I have. I'm like the, my, for the CBS, the first show to CBS, I have like the ticket stub. I have um, everything. I have the actual, well, this is kind of, I have the the, the, um, the cover of the Johnny Carson tribute, the, the actual script for it. Um, I'd have to look a little bit more, but um, I do own the very first late night script, which was February um, 82, show number one, which is extremely fantastic right there, i'm told so i own that i know rick shackman does i don't know how many are out there i would not guess yep um, two more when i showed hal gurney he just couldn't believe it he's just <laughs> then like a, i had him sign it and he was just like looking through it with marveling at it um i had some nbc tickets i think 
when I, for a couple of times when I wasn't able to make it, because I'd have to drive three and a half hours and I had school. Normally I'd, I'd, I'd be able to get out of this school. So sure. I some, definitely some, some, and then I have some CBS tickets when people, there were people that would send back the physical tickets. Um, really? Which was amazing. But when I got there, they, they got rid of the tickets, the, the actual tickets, and they were, it, it was completely different, but they had yeah. a lot of those just around. So I have, I have some of those. Um, Did you ever get a jacket? <clears throat> yeah, I, it was, I, I can't tell you how excited I was to get one of those. Now it's like going to eBay, but back then it was, I was like, I always wanted a jacket. And yep. yeah, for, um, yeah, they got, I have one. And uh, that was huge. I, I wore it nonstop. Yeah, they I wear mine all the time too. I've got four of them. And uh, one, my first one that I got was given to me from, from Arthur Kelly, actually. He gave me wow. one of his. And he said, welcome to the family. And, and that just Very cool. tears, tears coming down and all that stuff. So sure. they're powerful. Um, you still have oh, yours? I do. And I just remember I have, and I, somebody I think said Kathleen Akers put them together. I still have like one or two of the first taping at CBS. There was like a blue button that said I was the first Letterman taping. Or, so I have, I have some of those. Um, I, I really, I'm sure I have, uh, oh, I definitely, I have like the, some of the scripts. I have scripts. I have um, some of the, like the, the rundowns and stuff. Yeah, uh, yeah. NBC, um, which if people have never seen a rundown, it's basically what everybody on, on the staff or the crew would get, which is just every segment broken up and yep. what the elements were. So I have some of those. Um, we have a copy of the rundown from the very first late night that we're going to show on a podcast here. Amazing. Um, we're going to go through that just to, just to, to help everybody kind of. That's amazing. Get Where did up. you get it? Or did somebody just give you a copy? Uh, one of the staffers uh, gave me a copy of it. Awesome. He, he scanned it and sent it to me. And I it's love like, okay. hearing that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, let's say like, the first, I Bill Wendell's autograph in the first awesome. week. Wendell was coming by and it was like all camera crews everywhere. And I asked if he could sign something. And I said, um, and, and the camera crews were like, who is he? Is he somebody? I'm like, you don't know who Bill Wendell is. I'm not going to tell you. you oh, I know. love that. Oh, so that's I, a great I, idea. I'm yep. like, Bill, are you excited for tonight? And he just said something very sarcastic. But just, <laughs> okay. And then man worked for Ernie Kobeck. So, um, and then Calvert, uh, DeForest came and he signed something for me. I mean, it was really strange. I think I mentioned this. The first show in the first bunches of months, there were no... Um, at least when I was there, at least in the beginning, the first show, there were no barricades. So like when when um, Billy Joel arrived and I, I happened, I was in line and he was right there. I was able to get hey, his autograph. Awesome. Just like he literally gets out of the limo with him and Christy Brinkley. And I um, got their autographs. I remember then the, the next time I went to the show after the first one was, I think September then, like um, um, uh, which was Jerry Lewis, yeah. Rod Stewart, Sparky Mortimer, I think. And again, wow. we were in line and Rod Stewart shows up and no one else, like, like it got to the point where all the professional autograph collectors, it was like mayhem by the yeah. state where people wanted to get stuff signed. But when I was there, I was the only one. And then when Stewart, Rod Stewart was coming in for sound check, I just, yeah, it was, the accessibility um, was definitely different. And then after like, I don't know, nine months or a year, it just became this completely different i mean from yeah. show number one there were always people that were hanging outside um the show and it was it was basically hoping dave would call the payphone or call people in or sure you just never knew he was going to come out the the, the the double doors yep and stuff but waiting for the guest that was um yeah there wasn't a lot of that back in the, in the first when it started out I'm a big music fan. I'm a Gen X music guy, and 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 I loved uh, independent, alternative music, whatever you wanted to call it, growing up. And and there was this feeling, always, whenever um, I was a fan of a band, before they broke, and 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 I wasn't so bad with this. I was the guy that was really happy when the band broke and and things happened, good things happened for them. But there was always that segment of the audience that almost resented a little bit. It's like, hey, that's that's ours. Um, that's, that's no, our I know people like that. Sure, yeah, yeah. absolutely. And and I think that. Um, one of the things that's going to continually come up uh, as the arc of this, the life of this show yeah. uh, moves forward are the folks who almost resented late show uh, with how big Dave got and how powerful he became. I love powerful Dave. I always talk about that. I love late show very, very much, but there's a lot of people who would consider themselves almost purists. It's like, no, 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 this is ours. And uh, you were, you were there for a very, very interesting 
point. Uh, you've talked about the evolution of, of, of Dave, the phases of his career before in the Carson podcast. Again, yeah, yeah. ladies and true. gentlemen who are listening to this, the Carson podcast has so much Letterman in it. They, they, they tie to each other. I highly recommend going back and watching these episodes and listening to these episodes. Um, but uh, the phase that I love where Dave is right now, and this is where we're going to finish off here, yeah, sure. is, um, is, is he's doing the long form. And also pointed out to me very recently, also some little crazy things that are on YouTube that are late night-esque. It's no rules where he's just talking to camera with Barbara, with Mary, great stuff. Yeah. But the stuff, the forward facing stuff he's doing is more the long form. And I just wanted to ask, I think you'd have a really interesting perspective on this. Yeah. On my next guest uh, mm -hmm. with David Letterman, if there were three people you would like to see Dave uh, sit down with on the long form show, who would those people be? I mean, I probably, a couple of them are probably who you would pick. I think sitting down with Jay Leno, obviously, I think yeah. would be really interested in just talking to them about starting out in the clubs and they spent time together. And yep. Jay, um, you know, went on Dave's show something like 40 times on NBC. And I mean, you know, Letterman would always go on Carson's show and, and not always say this, but he would be like, thank you for my career to John yeah. at the end. He would say stuff like that all the time. And Letterman is just as responsible for for Leno getting the Tonight Show as, oh. and I've never, I don't know, I don't think that the whole thank you uh, being grateful. I think it's just it's different. They have it's a it's a very different relationship. Maybe they're peers. Listen, Jay's always been very nice to me. He, yeah. His show was number one. You can't take that away. He was nice nope. to his staff. Uh, he's um, no one works as hard as him. He's made a lot of people happy. But I think Le uh, Leno would be good. Um, yeah. I'm trying to think of like people that to sit down with that are still alive. Um, he's he's the one I'm having trouble. Like I could name famous people, but in terms of somebody who was, I mean, I guess Madonna would be interesting. Oh, that'd be an interesting. Yeah, that's a great answer. Only because yeah. I really like when she would go on Dave's show on NBC, Sandra Bernhardt, and yeah. she um, obviously. I mean, it's amazing. Like if you showed a young person out that it was kind of like historic television when Madonna went on and said the F-bombs that that was like national. Shut it out. Yep. I was actually, the, the, it's such a strange thing with Madonna. I've mentioned this, but the next time she was ever in the studio after that, I was there and it was, I think it was Valentine's Day that she wanted, she did a cameo with flowers and she gave them to Dave and she said, I'm not even going to say. And then she said the F word and it was muted. <laughs> yeah. Um, it was either that or it was something, but I think it was Valentine's Day. And so I was there both times for when she she came on. It was really weird on the on the on the early CBS. And then Madonna only made one cameo that I know, like a walk on unannounced thing on Leno. And I was there for that too, um, in ninety-four wow. in the spring of ninety-four, which is odd too. I'm like, what is this thing with Madonna and cameos? And I'm there uh for I mean, I just wanted I'd never seen the tonight show, so Jay was um I guess it was his second or third year he was coming in from New York to do shows out of 8H. Um, yep. So I was there. And he was um, picking up steam at that point too. They were really, they were starting to find their voice at that point. That Helen's was the and... most instrumental week of their entire yeah. run in yeah. terms of being in that studio and going back to Burbank and reconstructing. The Without thrust. a doubt. And, um, I remember when I was there, Ed Hall, who worked at Letterman, of course, they, they, Madonna was running late. I mean, I, I could tell back then because there were there was somebody something was happening, and then later it made sense it would have been Madonna, which Jimmy Brogan confirmed. So it was like Jay came up for his warm up, which he always did, and then Jimmy Brogan um, started talking to the crowd. And I was like, oh, this is really nice. They're gonna have the, I've never seen this. The head writer and Brogan was hilarious, taking questions, doing crowd work, which he does. And then Ed Hall comes, and I'm just like, I've never been in a show like this where they are just going over. And the, the, this much, uh, this is great. And then, um, then I found out later they were stolen because uh, Madonna was late, but it was great. It was so cool getting to ask questions and just seeing them. And they put me in the second row on the aisle, um, which was also uh, a nice thing. I mean, I was 18 at the time. And I think that they uh, were very big on putting younger people up front. Makes sense. Um, and, uh, but yeah, it was really cool getting to be there. Uh, be there for that. So yeah, Madonna, I think Madonna would be interesting. That's um, a great name. Yep. I, I mean, obviously, but it's like the people that I want are all gone. Like Calvert, I thought, or, or, or um, Harvey Picar. Yeah. Um, I just, in terms of, I'd have to really think, 
I mean, Broca and him are really close. I think it would be a fun oh, Tom episode. Broca, that's another not, interesting name. But yeah. I don't think it's something where I'm like, I'm dying to see. I think it would be interesting, and it's not going to happen to have Sandra Bernhardt on because Dave, like, just to this day, I yep. guess, apparently Sandra Bernhardt still has dreams about going on the show and he, you know, she stopped doing it. It was really, really hard. But that would be more inside baseball. Sure. I think. That's okay. Those are, Oh, I know who I'd point. I, I know who I'd pick in my top three. It was Bob Dylan. Oh, Dylan that's a great love, answer, too. Yeah. Dylan loved um, Dave's show, especially on yep. NBC. He went on the show a bunch. He did the Radio City Music 10th anniversary. He, was he originally went on to meet Larry Bud Melman, apparently. He, he thought Larry yeah. Bud Melman was hilarious. Yeah, he, he was a fan of the show. And Dylan doesn't do interviews like that almost ever. Um, yeah, that's a great answer. I thought them together would be great just having an organic chat you're probably going to get a lot better if you don't have an audience but um there for it but um i think i think that those are probably or bob morden maybe oh probably. my god yeah but again that's inside baseball but that's that, another but yeah. fascinating nonetheless yeah guys like you and i would be fascinated with yeah. that conversation right there or or, or burnett or or, or some of these other the public wants harrison ford and i get it they want yeah they want the big names i it's yeah. For sure. But yeah, Broca is a great answer too. Like, I mean, you, you, you talk about somebody legendary. I, well, Brian Williams is one of my favorite guests of all time. He the newsman. Really good. Even before he was really famous when he went on shows, yeah. occasionally he killed. I mean, Absolutely. Like and, a, but a newsman, an old school newsman, yeah. one who wouldn't talk about it, it almost made it a shtick. Yeah. to not give opinions because he was a right down the middle guy yeah. and you got Brokaw and rather and some of these some of these old school Barbara Walters for that matter uh you know Diane Sawyer people who who um saw the changing of the guard of the news and how related that is to Dave and his broadcasts and and yeah that is a that's a Brokaw's a fascinating answer that's a really good one I think that would be a a, a great Great talk, and also inside baseball because super fans would love that as well because they know about the connection. I, mean, I, I went to the Friars Club to interview Tom Brokaw, and uh, I couldn't Another believe the crazy he sentence he that you just it. said. Holy cow! I know, <laughs> I know. I think we were in the Ed Sullivan room, and it was uh, yeah. I mean, it was amazing just talking about Carson, and then I switched. Of course, I'm like, I have to talk uh, about Dave, but um, a lot of those uh, news guys, Dave, always love to have a. I will go on record, and I said this on the podcast, if Brian Williams would have gotten the 12.30 gig and had a late night show, he would have succeeded wildly. Give it to I him mean, now. Corden's leaving next year. Give it to him next year. He would have, he would have, <laughs> there's no question that he would have been good in my, if I had to guess right away, yep. likability. And it takes, it just takes a little time for the public to accept somebody in a different role. Sure. Like when Colbert would start at his late show, people, there are so many people that were just like, well, he's, he's not, the same character and this is no. uncomfortable because i'm not used to this and then yep. it just takes the public a while i think finding that voice too yeah. right they needed to figure out what they were doing as well and what his voice was going to sound it like it takes and, a year at least for those shows if not more to find voices and a lot yep. of take more than a year but i think williams would have succeeded i mean i have no doubt that if he had that opportunity he would have he would have succeeded. He's not in my top three, uh, but he's in my top five. So, so yeah, I, I, we, we, you and I think very, very similarly. Um, listen, Mark, uh, you're going to come back. Thank you for that. Um, I just want to say also uh, on a personal note, yeah. thank you for your contribution to the thing that I love. The fact that the Carson podcast exists um, has inspired me to do this. You and and, wow. and and a few other key people have inspired me to step forward and say, "Why not me?" And do this. but but the fact that you have that, uh, you know, I love Bill Carter. I can't wait till our paths cross. I want to talk to Bill yeah. Carter very very badly. Sure um, I look at what he did when he wrote Late Shift, and then again, of course, Story for Late Night as well, and and how he must have inspired you, and this body of work that you have built with the Carson podcast, I've said it so many times. Um, I am bewildered and uh, extremely shocked at how quickly people have forgotten Johnny Carson and how big he was. And in my opinion, still is the, the cultural worldwide impact that that man made. And I've got 25 year old kids who don't even know who he is. And one of the reasons that I'm starting, I'm doing the Letterman podcast is because I'm not going to let that happen to Dave. I'm going to be a conduit, a transfer of knowledge, a torchbearer, whatever you want to call it 
for the body of work that Dave and company created. You, sir, have done that with Johnny Carson, and okay, I yeah. cannot tell you how grateful I am for you, Mark Malkoff, for doing it. That's very nice. I admire what you're doing. I wish you all of the success. Um, I, I asked people that, to be guests that I, sh I was 99% sure <laughs> were going to say no to me, and they would, a lot of people said yes. I mean, it was one of those things like, Mark, how do you get all these big guests? I'm like, it's not me. They want to talk about Johnny Carson. They'd never... I didn't realize that when I picked the Carson podcast, I wanted my questions answered. I wanted to know what it was like being a guest. Sure. Everyone, like all these big names said yes only because they'd never had a long form um, place to talk about. Yes. Going on Carson, which I always equate it to like for some of these people, it's like, it was like their college experience, which was like their favorite part of their life. And they just never really get to talk about it to at length. So there's been a lot of that. So I say not keep, just keep on knocking on doors and uh, just go for people you think are unattainable and uh, you just never know. And I well, just, I thought it was gonna be seven episodes. I, I do it the most. And just, you just never know when you start out with something and you just have good intentions like you do um, for sure. So I wish you the best. I appreciate that. Um, and off camera, off, uh, you know, uh, on the, on the texted machine, I will be asking you for advice along the way. And yeah, uh, sure. And, and I mean, I had no so. idea what I was doing. I still don't know how much I know what I'm doing, but uh, yeah. Yeah, if you need anything, please. Oh, I, I can't. I can't thank you enough um, to this community, to the Letterman Podcast community. That's what we're doing here. That's what we're building right. here. We're telling stories. We're uh, getting to the point where 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 this transfer of knowledge will continue on, um, and and we've got a lot of very cool things planned. So please no uh, subscribe. Please uh, share the podcast, whether you like us or not, please share us and subscribe. Cause even if you don't like us, somebody else, you know, may um, we're very grateful that you've given us a chance. Thank you so much. Uh, this has been another episode of the Letterman podcast. My name is Mike Chisholm. Thank you. And good night. Overcoat and underpants. <laughs>